clansmen. The cave clan. The cave clan. The cave clan. The cave clan. The cave clan drains and tunnels. There was a time when almost everyone had heard of the cave clan. Well, almost everyone. Excuse me. Have you ever heard of cave clan? Uh, tell me about it. Can you please explain what the cave clan is all about? It started off just exploring mines, caves, that sort of thing, something to do in your spare time. It went on to drains, that's why we called the cave clan and not the drain dwellers or whatever. But while their story has been told many times before, there's an aspect to the cave clan that has never been explored. The culture, creativity and community inspired by this underground world and the artists born from the group. This is the story of the cave clan and the art they created. If someone asked me to explain what the cave clan is in a short sentence, I would struggle because I don't do short sentences. They're a like-minded group of people who explore pretty much any artificial man-made structure. Just about every type of person's involved. And they've all got a couple of things in common. But the main thing is they've got that sense of adventure. Over the summer of 85, 86, we sort of talked about the idea of starting a group that explored caves and mines and, and drains. We didn't have cars, probably didn't have a lot of disposable income. There was plenty of drains nearby, so we started doing drains. I'd always been an explorer of drains and tunnels all my life. That always attracted me and it was just something that always appealed to me. You're not meant to go down there, so people are always going to do something they're not meant to do, even if they think it's going to be fun and a bit dangerous at the same time. What a combination. Excitement, danger, fun. Despite the risks, the possibility of an adventure beneath our streets proved irresistible, and in a few short years, the cave clan went from a hobby to a serious pastime. If you want to attract members to your group, You've got to make it going in drains interesting. Kill the myth that all drains are round concrete pipes with rats in them. This is Melbourne's underground drains. A very tranquil world. A world of storm water, sewers and other service tunnels. The spaces the cave clan explore were the result of a post-war building boom that saw flood-prone creeks and rivers diverted underground, creating a vast network of drains and tunnels that now crisscross Melbourne. A lot of cave clan people feel that we have the right to explore drains because they're, they're public property, they're public creeks or rivers that just lead underground. We don't think anyone owns the drains. What the cave clan discovered was spaces they could make their own spaces that would allow the community to flourish and their creativity to flow. Anzac's a big drain that runs off the Yarra River and it's a sacred place for the clan. In the 1990s, membership grew to around 300 members and the group needed more space to accommodate a variety of activities. We started off as an art gallery. We, we put canvases, which were just whitewash areas up on the walls. We'd have painting nights and people would go down there especially to do painting and over time more and more people have used the drains to display their art. Well I'm into sound and that's why I go in the drains. I used to think the, that some of these spaces were like a free recording studio. The sounds are, are awash with reverb and natural echoes. So therefore, my recordings will always have that sound to them.
Probably I started photographing drones in 1989, joined the clan in 1990. Photographing drones appealed to me. I think it was the light actually in, in, in the drones that I liked, There's the black and then just beautiful side lighting that you'd get and it was just a way of containing a landscape. You know, when, you, when you're walking around with someone trying to do a, a good portrait or a good photograph, the landscape can be overwhelming and just to bring it down to a graphic circle or a square with black and it was, it was good to compose with and exciting to explore. There was a level of excitement about drain exploring and tunnel exploring that, that appealed to me. With some people, there's something inside them that drives them to these crazy creative pursuits. And I think the cave clan fulfills that either creatively or someone like Duggo, who wouldn't consider himself to be an artist, does all this crazy creative stuff, creates a subculture. With the photography, I'm point and click. And with the sounds, I'm walking, oh, that's a cool sound. Other people, whatever their reason for doing it, it's more extreme than mine. I just like being in drains with people, it's as simple as that. The sweet smelling drains. <laughs> that sound crazy. I'm Doug, formerly Duggo. Woody Sloth and I started up the Cave Clan in, on Australia Day 1986 is when we officially came up with the name and the logo. The Cave Clan has got what everyone should have in their life, and that is a Duggo. If you don't have a Duggo in your life, then your life will not be as good. The hardest thing to explain to some people is it's, it's not necessarily about going in drains. The Cave Clan is the relationships that have been formed, the friendships that have been formed, the genuine friendships, the lifelong friendships. Like, I've got friends now that will be friends until the, one of us die. Hey, some photos. I was all about spreading the word and gaining information and, and members, so I, I videoed whenever I could and I, I took photos whenever I could. We'd meet up each week and people would show you the photos they've taken. And I sort of liked that part of it, so I really got into it. But we'd always have a photo, a group shot. And that was a lot to do with going into the, the magazine, into Il Drono. Pagan and I were going into the Abbotsford Pipe, one of the worst drains in Melbourne. We started seeing the same names everywhere, and then we started associating those names with Cave Clan. And then we found somewhere there was written on the drain wall the address that you could write to as a post office box. So we wrote to them, and then about it wasn't that long, about two weeks later, we get this thing in the mail and it's my first copy of Anil Drano and I'm just like, wow, man, what the hell's this? Il Drano is the Cave Clan newsletter. It's a zine that I've made for on and off for 30 years. It's content is all Cave Clan based. Photos of things that we've been doing, write-ups from people on exploring coming events, regular columns such as Fly on the Wall, which is just funny comments or things that people say that they don't want others to know. Shop Talk column, which is the ADEU, which is Amalgamated Drone Explorers Union. A double murder, armed robbery, and another murder. What I forgot about. What are you in for, Elf? Uh, exploring trains? Who makes zines about going in drains? Me. <laughs> well, most zines have a short lifespan and a small audience, Doug has published Il Drano for over 30 years, for 100 subscribers and nearly 100 editions. The reason Il Drano is written the way it is, like sort of tabloid, is because I, I can't do much seriously. I fuck around all the time. I want to have fun.
My father drowned when I was seven in a boating accident. It was Lake Bull Oak. He was going to buy a boat. When the boat hit a submerged tree, he fell out. And the boat smacked him in the head and his waders filled up. So he was missing for a while and didn't find his body. My mother tried to keep it from us for a while. How I found out was I was at school and one of my older brother's friends came up to me and said, is it true your dad's dead? I just knew. A lot of Cave Clan members have said to me that the Cave Clan is like their family. My father used to be always going camping, fishing, and I was doing things that I would have been doing with my father and if my mother wasn't under so much pressure from having five kids. So I think the Cave Clan is just a substitute for family life. I still love doing it with a group of people and, and um, socialising and getting out of manhole covered in dirt in front of people. I, it wasn't that I was an attention seeker, but it didn't bother me. Coming out of a manhole, you know, there's a few reasons why it's, um, why it's a highlight for most people. Sometimes when you've gone so far up a drain and you're in pain and you know, I'm not going to be able to get out and I'm going to have to walk all the way back, but you, you know how far back is, so you just keep going and going. In those situations, it's such a relief. You just feel like getting out and just lying down, even if you're on a road or whatever. You just So there's that sort of, I made it, I beat you. <laughs> when people see you, you know, they're like, holy shit, and especially when 20 of you climb out one at a time. And you, you get out and you just start talking about, oh yeah, that was so cool, that was a good drain. You know, it's like you're finished. The climbing out of a manhole, it is that, that born again sort of thing. Rebirthing. As a young photojournalist, documentary photographer, I was looking for something that was edgy, something that was potentially illegal, something that was a little bit dangerous, and that's something that not everyone was interested in doing. So I, was, I think I was in my second year of college. I was, became pretty aware studying fine art photography that I didn't want to be a fine art photographer, and I was more interested in photojournalism, social documentary photography, and whilst at college, I just went down that road. And I'd been photographing drains and exploring them. And just became aware of the cave clan just through these stickers that I was seeing around Melbourne. And they were everywhere. They were on trams and bus stops. You know, there was great graphic design and they had a PO box and there was a sense of mystery about it. And it was really enticing. Then I remember once walking out of a drain and two big guys coming down the drain. And of course, they're just silhouettes. And I was with a friend and we're not big guys. And I hadn't really bumped into anyone whilst drain exploring. And it was kind of scary. And these guys approached us and asked us a few questions about draining, including, have you heard about the cave clan? And say, so, oh yeah, I've heard about the Cave Clan, yeah, yeah. And we, we went our separate ways. I decided to uh, contact the Cave Clan, so I'd got a lot of my better drain photographs and put them in a letter and sent them to the P.O. box and just crossed my fingers. The second day that we had this P.O. box, I thought, oh, I'm going to check it, thinking there's no way there's going to be anything in there. I was just thinking, oh, what's this going to be? And it was from Matt. That time, and it was like he'd had a few pages and he'd stuck photos of all these drains he'd taken. He's like, I've been trying to get hold of you guys for so long. I just saw this sticker on, you know, whatever, whatever. And the relationship built from there, and I was invited to go drain exploring with them, and they welcomed me in. Working with the Cave Clan did have its, its challenges because they were kind of in this um, grey area of not wanting to show their faces whether it was legal. In fact, I'm pretty sure it wasn't legal. And they were quite into the enigma of people not knowing who they were. 
know, when you when you're walking around with someone trying to do a, a good portrait or a good photograph, the landscape can be overwhelming. And just to bring it down to a graphic circle or a square with black, and it was it was good to compose with. Brain photography offered me the opportunity to explore black artistically. I wasn't a great person with lighting and I liked working with natural light but I did like the drama of, of light and black. Long exposures, you know, water flowing, there were some beautiful effects to be found there as well and the colours. If he was in a drain and it could be the crappiest, most boring drain there is but if it had a tinge of green in it, that was it, he was set. We used to call him Shades of Green. You want a beer, Shades of Green? You know, like that was, <clears throat> I don't know if he liked that name. When I reflect back on, on those times, I, I, I realise that probably Doug did take advantage of me being a photographer in the group and wanted to share all the varieties of drains with me. He'd often organise a, an expedition to show me a particular shape drain and knowing that I'd take a photograph. And, and Doug was not afraid of publicity, he, he loved it. I love getting these camera crews. It was a, a great adventure we had with a British camera crew. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Nothing to worry about. We had to go in this tunnel and we went in. By the time we were coming out, we were up to our knees and we got some great international coverage and, and Doug was just so excited about that. It. It's dark, dank and cold down here, but for Melbourne's cave clan, the city's storm drain system is a subterranean wonderland of tunnels and chambers. And when I look at these people, I, I'm, I'm thinking that they're really enjoying being documented, that they're really enjoying being in the spotlight. And you know, I was really welcomed by this group. I mean, there's only so much walking up and down drains you can really do without wanting to be a hero and a celebrity about it. Tell you what's different about me, right? I've got these two big things on the side of my head. They're like radar dishes, satellite dishes, and you can't turn them off. So they're just constantly going the whole time. You can be walking along with big ears in a drain and he'll just freeze and you'll think, it looks like he's seen a, a ghost. And he'll just like, man, did you hear that? That sound, he goes, I reckon that was a six wheeler going over the mountain. Did you hear that in the distance? That'd be about two kilometres away. His big ears would be like... <laughs> and, um, you know, like he, and I, I just look at him and go, you're a freak. Oh, mate, I can hear way up a drain. I know what's coming before I even get there. When I go inside the drain, I feel like something happens to my ears. They kind of like, they start to feel nice. I don't know what it is. It's like maybe there's less road noise or something. Or well, there's just sort of space for sound to, to happen in, you know. I get excited by sounds. I get even more excited by new sounds. I've been recording sounds for about 30 years and I've got over 4,000 recordings in my archive. I've got most of the bridges, all the big drains, I've just gone in there and recorded them as they are. Sounds that no one else has got on their recordings. Sounds that no one else has used in a musical context. So what's happening there is that the cars are making that sound up the other end as well. But because we're far away from that end, it sounds boomy, but it sounds more, more like a, a tack or a tap up here because we're not up that end. So we're sort of hearing the sounds in reverse. It's really weird.
For me to go and buy an instrument from a shop, it's very unnatural. Big Ears is gonna go, nah, I've heard it, I wanna have another instrument. So I will make that sound. This is the latest electric hurdy-gurdy. I'm right into building electric hurdy-gurdies. <laughs> I tell people I'm an instrument builder, but I'm more than that. I make sound sculptures, I make instruments, I do installations, I do electronic music, I build electronic gadgets. So it's all sort of encompassed under sound art. When you go into a space that's, that's empty, like an empty factory, a drain, a car park, anything that's got hard surfaces where sound bounces around, there's a certain open, acoustic thing there so it's almost like a blank canvas you can just go in and start making noise start making sounds and it will sound interesting because it's an interesting space acoustically i've had a, a little band called clunk and we started going down in the drains around oh, 97 i think it might have been and in some ways i suppose i learned how to play music in the drains with my band Enter at Own Risk was a little series that I did where we held a couple of very intimate performances in the drain. I think people were into the idea that they had enough safe music in their life and they wanted to have an experience that was otherworldly. Sometimes we had 10 people. One time we had a couple of hundred people turn up. At the turn of the millennium, interest in experimental music reignited in Australia. Suddenly, musicians had places to play and audiences eager to listen. So Clunk went from playing in these really resonant spaces to going into doing live performances in dead sounding bars with lots of dampening materials like curtains, couches, people. I stopped making instruments that I thought would sound good in a drain and then I started concentrating on making the instruments sound like a drain but in a live space. His band, Clunk, they had a gig at a place in, I think it was Brunswick Street, Fitzroy, and I, I invited a few people on who no even weren't into exploring and it was a disaster because it's very specific and the, he's more, he's more, it's more noise than music. Held every Tuesday night for 18 years, Melbourne's Make It Up Club is an improvisation music club that gives experimental musicians a place to perform. I've just created an orchestra that's utilising all of my instruments. There's about 15 people. I've got about 20 instruments all up. Sound qualities are hard to talk about, but usually when you hear the sound, it moves you in a certain way. It might give you a tingle in the spine, or it might, you know, make your eye twitch funny like that, or I don't know, it's just like, I mean, people are into harmony, I'm not. I'm into dissonance. I like noise and dissonance. I find that lovely. To me, there's no such thing as the wrong note. Once upon a time, I wanted to make beautiful sounds with my instruments, but now I just want to make brutal noise. That might change later, but that's what I'm doing at the moment. Sound can also be a weapon. The artist leaves a wound. I'll make your ears bleed. (laughs) 
Of all the artists to emerge from the Cave Clan, Ashley Gilbertson is arguably the most accomplished. In 2004, he won the Robert Kappa Gold Medal Award for his coverage of the battle to reclaim Fallujah. Now New York-based, Gilbertson regularly works for the likes of the New York Times and humanitarian organisations like UNICEF. But it was in Melbourne that Gilbertson honed his skills as a photojournalist as he documented his friends as they began exploring with the Cave Clan. So my name is Ashley Gilbertson and I'm a photojournalist. As a teenager growing up in Melbourne, you know, I, I photographed skateboarders, I photographed graffiti artists, and I photographed the Cave Clan. The Cave Clan, you know, did have a sort of social scene that went with it. The most appealing part of it was, though, exploring and adventuring and learning about these spaces that nobody else knew about. And it was really visual. You would come across these amazing sort of lighting situations inside the stormwater drain from manhole covers or from grates or the entrances and exits. And I'd have to shoot an extremely challenging situation. It's almost pitch black and I've got to wait until I know that somebody's not moving for half a second in order to shoot a picture. I train myself in the technical elements and then I train myself in how to, you know, watch the rhythms of people. I think the drain exploring absolutely set me up for working in, you know, really difficult and often dangerous situations later. When you're running across the street in Iraq and you're getting shot at from three different angles and you need to shoot pictures at the same time, I don't need to think about how to time that photograph. It's part of how I live and breathe. I went from exploring stormwater drains to photographing stories uh, throughout Asia and then Central Asia and then Africa, uh, the Middle East. I mean, there's definitely a connection between, you know, photographing things like um, the conflict in Iraq or Afghanistan or, you know, West Papua and you know, other places that I've been. You know, including to this day when I'm working with refugees in uh, the Balkans, in Greece, in Germany, in Austria, there is a sense of adventure in the work that I do now, the work that I've done for the last 20 years, and the work that I did with the Cave Clan. There's a sense of going places that very few people go because they're either not allowed to be there, because they don't want to be there, because it's dangerous, you know, for a variety of reasons. Photographing that and then reporting back, that, that to me is very, very compelling thing. Cave Clan, I think for me, and for a lot of people who um, spent time with those guys exploring, um, was very much a rite of passage. The people were always far more compelling than the drains themselves. I really enjoyed seeing, you know, the different shapes and the different designs that would go into these spaces underground that nobody would ever see necessarily. Um, there's, there's something fascinating about that, except the interaction of those spaces that are not designed for people, with people in them, is where, to me, it became really interesting. And I feel like it was a really formulative time of my life. <laughs> 